I am here personally right now to uh, introduce my next guest speaker. I wanted to do that myself um, for Mr. Jordan Maxwell. I've known of Jordan's work for at least five years, and I've had the pleasure of getting to know him personally for about two years off and on now. Uh, and he has become a, a personal hero of mine. Before that, it was, well, Batman. Um, <laughs> Um, but you know the Hollywood movie. Uh, the valiant youth who, who learns of his destiny at an early age and goes out and battle, battles the forces of evil. Jordan is that hero in the flesh, at least to me he is. Um, and to you, once you get to know him and his work, um, his work of over 40 years, both academically and experientially. <clears throat> um, he is going to lay out the groundwork today of our history, our hidden history, a, a lesson that we all need to know about of, of things that we aren't taught, things that are here going on uh, right in front of our eyes which is the best place to hide things. And uh, we have an exclusive tomorrow. Gor uh, Jordan will lay out the groundwork today, and he will bring a guest with him tomorrow. And they will bring us up to date. And he has some very interesting, profound information for this contemporary audience. Um, so for now, he will lay the groundwork, give you a history lesson that you are going to want to hear. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the work and um, the experience of a man that I would like to call my hero and friend, Mr. Jordan Maxwell. Good, it works. I want to thank all of you for being here with me. Is this going to give me problems because I'm... Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, maybe we can turn it down in the back. We're going to have to turn it down in the back a little bit. Okay. Uh, I was going to do slides and talk a little bit about religion and then uh, talk a little bit about government. And uh, <laughs> but I decided that uh, if I were to bring slides, it's going to take me all night because there's just so much I want to say about the system we live under. It is the most incredible um, array of treason, lies, crimes against the state. Uh, it's just an, uh, an incredible story of how this country operates, who owns it, and consequently, uh, I, as I said, if I brought slides, I wouldn't get through tonight. So I'm just going to kind of, I'm going to kind of meander over some of the points I want to make. And it may not follow a consistent pattern, but just kind of follow along with me. Because the, the point I want to make tonight is that words are very important. We as humans are word controlled. We are word controlled humans. You can say something to someone and they will beat you up because they don't like the words. You can say something to another person and they will love you because of the words. But what you need to understand is that there's a world of difference between a dictionary definition of a word and a legal or lawful dictionary uh, dictionary uh, definition of a word. When you go into court, when you're dealing with attorneys and judges, the words that you use do not mean the same thing at all. Let me give you uh, some examples of what I'm talking about. Uh, here it is. Corpus Juris Secundum which is a complete restatement of the American, entire American law. 
Corpus Juris Secundum, which is a huge set of law volumes in any good law uh, library, and I photocopied this. <clears throat> Under the heading of attorney and client, it says, an attorney has an obligation to the courts and to the public no less significant than his obligation to his clients. Thus, an attorney occupies a dual position which imposes dual obligations. His first duty is to the courts and to the government or public, not to the client. So the first duty of an attorney is to the courts and to the government and not to the client. And whenever the duties of his client conflict with those he owes as an officer of the court in the administration of justice, the former must yield to the latter. So anytime you might have a difference with what the judge is doing or the courts are doing, it doesn't matter. They're the boss, and the attorney works for them, not you. Then in Corpus Juris Secundum, it goes on to say under attorney and client, a client is one who applies to a lawyer or a counselor for advice or direction in a question of law. A client is also called a ward of the court in relation to his relationship with his attorney. Clients, if you hire an attorney, you're a client. And a client is a ward of the court. Look up in Black's Law Dictionary the word ward of the court, and it says an infant or a person of unsound mind. <laughs> According to the law, if you hire an attorney, you're an idiot. <laughs> That's what the law book says. <clears throat> See if you can remember this quotation. For the first time, a civilized nation has full gun registration. Our streets will be safer, our police more effective, and the world will follow our lead to the future. Hmm? That's it, Adolf Hitler. <clears throat> you know how many uh, employees the United States Post Office has? No. How many, how many employees did the United States Post Office have? A guess. 800,000. Okay. All of you are wrong. Five. Five employees of the United States of America Post Office. Now, we have a privately owned company owned by a guy in England that's called the United States Postal Service, not Post Office. Postal Service is a privately owned company. It's owned by some people in England, and they have a franchise to operate here in America with your mail. So when you go into what you call the post office, just remember, it is not run by the American government. This is a privately owned corporation. <coughs> and consequently, it's operating as a military unit, and that's why if you're drafted, you can go down and square in at the post office because it is under international military justice. So I think that there's – I want to read you something here to give you an idea about – because this is the world of occultism that I love, and this is the kind of thing that I love. I want to read you something. You probably have heard this before. Abraham Lincoln – and the reason I'm reading this is to show you that there is a world of occult power behind world governments. And most people think things just happen by chance. No way. There, and the whole idea is, I think, well expressed in this. Abraham Lincoln was elected to Congress in 1846. Abraham Lincoln was elected to Congress in 1846. John Kennedy was elected to Congress 1946, 100 years exactly. Abe Lincoln was elected president in 1860. John Kennedy was elected president 1960. The names Lincoln and Kennedy both contain seven letters. Both were particularly concerned with civil rights. Both wives lost children while living in the White House. Both presidents were shot on a Friday. Both presidents were shot in the head. 
Lincoln's secretary was named Miss Kennedy. Kennedy's secretary was named Miss Lincoln. Both were assassinated by Southerners. Both were succeeded by Southerners. Both Southerners were named Johnson. Andrew Johnson succeeded Lincoln, was born in 1808. Lyndon Johnson succeeded Kennedy, born in 1908. John Wilkes Booth, who assassinated Lincoln, born 1839. Lee Harvey Oswald, who assassinated Kennedy, born 1939. Both assassins were known by three names, John Wilkes Booth, Lee Harvey Oswald. Both names are comprised of 15 letters. Lincoln was shot at a theater named Ford. Kennedy was shot in a car made by Ford called Lincoln. <laughs> John Wilkes Booth ran from the theater and, caught, and was caught in a warehouse. Oswald ran from a warehouse and was caught in the theater. <laughs> I like this one. A week before Lincoln was shot, he was in Monroe, Maryland, and a week before Kennedy was shot, he was in Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> oh, I get back to this postal thing. You know that when you walk in a post office, you no longer have a postal worker. Uh, if your mail comes back to you, it says it's coming back and you should go to the postal service to see a retail clerk at the postal service. That's why they no longer have FBI pictures in the post office. And you can buy bubble gum and, and all kinds of uh, toys in there because it's now owned by someone that is not a citizen in this country. And consequently, I think probably the most extraordinary thing, well, this is a quotation from John Swington, and I'll, I'll have photocopies of this, and you can get a whole set if you wish. John Swington, the former chief of staff of the New York Times, was referred to while living as the dean of his profession. In 1953, he gave a toast before the New York Press Club in New York City, and he said this, there is no such thing at this date of the world's history in America as an independent press. You know it and I know it. There's not one of you who dares to write your honest opinion. If you did, you would beforehand, you know beforehand that it would never appear in print. I am paid weekly to keep my honest opinions out of the paper I am connected with. Others of you are paid similar salaries for similar re things, and any of you would be foolish as to write an honest opinion that would be out on the streets, because you'd be out on the streets looking for a new job. And he goes on to say, we're nothing more than jumping jacks while our masters pull the strings, we dance. Consequently, our press, the, the uh, media, is, of course, owned and controlled by money. Uh, in the ancient system of the Druids, thousands of years ago, even a thousand years before the Roman Empire in Northern Europe, there was a whole system of religion and government called the Druidic system. That system exists today, right now, in this country and in the Western world. All over what we would call the Western world is a Druidic system. And if you understand the Druids and their symbols and their words and terms, and the symbols in government and religion, then you will see Druidism everywhere. One of the most important symbols in the Druid religion was the magic wand, like Merlin the magician with his magic wands, and Mickey Mouse in the, in, with his magic wand. Magic wands, the reference works say, were always made out of holly, wood. Consequently, the holly tree is very important to the ancient Celtic Druidic system of religion. Hollywood is very important to this whole process of the manipulation of the minds of people in the Western world. I have little to no respect for Hollywood or anybody working in it. I'm very close to it. I live around it. I know many people in it, but I know what it's doing. Uh, a most important subject well, I said words. And before I hit that, let's go to the word public in a law dictionary. The word public 
is the populace, the community, that vast multitude which includes the ignorant, the unthinking, the credulous, who in making a purchase do not stop to analyze but are governed by appearances and general impressions. That's the public as far as the law is concerned. Now let me, let me at this point, well here's one more, this is a doozy. In a law book, if you call yourself a human being, go to a law book and look up the word human being and it will tell you sea monster. <laughs> All right? So then you turn over to monster and there it is. A lawful dictionary, a law dictionary's definition of a monster is a human being by birth but in some part resembling a lower animal. A monster has no inheritable blood and cannot be heir to any land. Consequently, <clears throat> we as human beings are not, we're not men and women. We're considered human beings. And the word human being goes back to the Crusades when the knights were traveling across Europe on their way to Jerusalem. They were fathering a lot of illegitimate children. And of course, the offspring of a knight would inherit the father's uh, fortune. And the church was not allowed and was not going to allow that. So they designated all the babies coming from the knights to be, to be acting like they're being human, but they're not actually human. They're not actually a man or a woman. They're like being human. So consequently, we today are like that. We're just acting like we're human. And consequently, the law refl it reflects that. Now, here's the basis for what is going on here. Cecil Rhodes, uh, British statesman and empire builder, in his last will, it says in the reference work on, in People's Almanac says, in the last, uh, in the first five wills, Cecil Rhodes repeatedly called for a, quote, secret society, the true aim and object whereof shall be the extension of the British rule throughout the world and eventually the ultimate recovery of the United States of America. So there's a secret society operating around the world that has as its true aim and objective the destruction of the freedom of our country. And these people are British royalty, not the English people. The English people are a beautiful people, have a very beautiful history. The country, and even the UK, all three of the countries, are beautiful countries with beautiful people. But the British royalty, in my humble opinion, are the most evil uh, operation on the face of the earth. I believe they're behind the drug trafficking, mafia, bloodletting. And when David Icke talks about the possibility that there might be reptilian influence there, I'm going to give you my opinion on that based on my own personal research. I think he's totally right on this. I think there's a very good case can be made for the existence of reptilians. And I totally agree that the reptilian influence on this earth is frightening in its implications. And I believe this not because David Icke's reasons. I have my own reasons that I arrived at the same place a long time ago also. So if you are privy to the kind of research that David and I are doing, you'll see what I mean. There's a lot of very powerful uh, proof out there that something very serious is going on. Now, the main thing that I wanted to talk about today, uh, I, I, I wanted to talk about religion a little bit at first, but I've got too much to say about government right now. So I, wanna, I want you to understand something very clearly. When, you, when you, anyone asks you in this country, are you a citizen of the United States? Okay? Now, a lot of you have, may have heard this. I'm just going to give you a general overall uh, picture of this. Uh, when someone asks you in this country, are you a citizen of the United States? What you think that they are asking you is are you lawfully in this country? Are you lawfully here to do business and be here? That's not what they ask you. The country is called America. America is the name of the country. 
But in the 1860s, late 1860s, a group of men got together and incorporated a privately owned company. Anyone can in incorporate a privately owned company, and a group of men did. They incorporated a company, privately owned, and they called the company the United States Company Corporation. And according to corporate law, and anyone who has a corporation or a business knows that according to corporate law, all corporations must have a president. That's the law. And it must have a vice president. And it must have a secretary of treasury. That's corporate law. So the corporation had to have a president and a vice president. Today, when you see uh, once, a year, once a year at the uh, State of the Union, when you see the president come out and the Speaker of the House says, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Everybody in this country thinks he's the President of America. America doesn't have a President. This is a corporate term used in business. The United States Corporation is a privately owned company. It's privately owned. And it's a 10-mile square that it operates in called the District of Columbia. Columbia simply means universal. This is what Catholic means, universal. When you start tracing back the ownership of the corporation called United States, privately owned company, then you begin to see that if you say that you are a citizen of the United States, what you're saying lawfully is that you are an employee of a foreign corporation on the international maritime law. You are an employee of a privately owned company. Therefore, if you are living in any state such as California and you're making money here, then what you are doing quite literally is moonlighting because you are already working for and are an employee of a privately owned company called United States Corporation. But you are earning money in California. Therefore, you are a franchisee of a foreign corporation under maritime law. You're a franchisee. It's like opening up a McDonald's here. You can open up a McDonald's, but you're not the boss of McDonald's. The McDonald's Corporation is the boss. They tell you what you can sell and what you can't sell and how much it's going to be, and they call the shots. You can merely be a franchisee uh, operating under their jurisdiction. So consequently, each one of us who call ourselves a uh, citizen of the United States is in point of fact a franchisee of a foreign corporation, and once a year you have to pay what is referred to as a California Franchise Tax Board. Because you're a franchisee of a foreign corporation under international law. Let me explain something to you. There are two kinds of law on the earth, basically two kinds of law, uh, Roman civil law and maritime admiralty. Roman civil law comes from the word civil or civili in Latin, meaning the people of the Illies. The people of the Illies are the people of God, civili. And the civil law is referred to as the law of the land. But there is a higher law that governs the whole earth. That's the ones I think the reptilians are into. There's a higher law that operates on the earth, and it has nothing to do with the civil law of any country, because civil laws are different in every country. You can do things in Africa you can't do in Spain. You, know, you can do things here in America you can't do in France, because the people's law, the law of the land, is different according to the culture. But when you talk about the maritime admiralty law, what you're talking about is the law of water, the law of banks. Banking law is called maritime admiralty. And consequently, this is why, incidentally, the Statue of Liberty could not be put on land in this country. It had to be put in a port. It had to be put in water. Why? Because it's not the Statue of Freedom. It's the Statue of Liberty. Liberty is what a sailor gets when you pull into port because the admiral gives the captain on the board the ship ownership of your body. You ask permission to leave. 
And if he lets you, which he's most likely not going to, but if he allows you to leave, you have liberty. You don't have freedom. And as long as you call yourself a United States citizen, you are an employee of a foreign corporation incorporated under international law, under maritime law, and consequently you are a franchisee of a foreign corporation. They own you. Now, let me show you how they own you. When a ship pulls into port, say, from Japan and uh, brings in, say, $800 million worth of Toyotas or televisions, the first thing the captain has to do is fill out a, has to give to the port authorities something called a certificate of manifest. He has to give them a certificate showing how much each car costs, whether it has four doors or two, or if it's got air conditioning or not. Every car has to have a certificate of manifest showing exactly what are you bringing into this country, how much is it going to cost our banks, how much are we going to have to pay Japan for this. And so it's business that it comes in on water. It's maritime admiralty, banking law. And so therefore, each item has to have a certificate of manifest. And the ship, when it pulls into port, parks at the dock. And wherever it parks is called the berthing of a ship. The ship sits in its berth. Now, when you were born, your mother, her water broke. And when your mother's water broke, you came out, and therefore you are a maritime admiralty product. Under international law, you are a product. Under international maritime banking law, you are a product. Because you came out of your mother's water, and therefore you have to have a birth certificate. And the birth certificate has to be signed by the dock. Okay? <laughs> and consequently, yeah. And consequently, um, if you go to Sears and you buy something that's too large to take home, they'll bring it to you. And so they will tell you what time they're going to deliver the product. That's why your mother was in a delivery room. She was delivering a product on the international law. Now, when you get the birth certificate, that is a certificate, a maritime admiralty certificate that shows you are a human resource. And the corporation called United States went to your mother and asked her, would you donate this body to us as, as a collateral for a loan? because each birth certificate is worth, when it first started in 1933, I am told it was like $630,000 per birth certificate on the international uh, exchange. And your birth certificate today is on the stock market. And look on the back of your Social Security card, and you'll see numbers in red. Anytime you see red numbers, they represent your blood. You turn it on the other side, and you'll see it in blue. Blue is maritime admiralty, the navy blue. And so consequently, you are a product that was bought. And on the birth certificate down on the bottom right where your mother signed, it doesn't say mother or parent. It says informant because your mother was informing on you on the maritime law. She was telling the corporation, I got a new chump here for you to own. And I don't know if you know this or not, so here's his paperwork. And it was sent to Washington, D.C. They took that birth certificate. And what happened, uh, let me go back and explain that when in 1860s, when this privately owned company was incorporated called United States, like any other corporation that grows too fast, it started getting out of bounds. It started becoming very successful, and they wanted to move out overseas. I'm being very... Uh, simplistic with this. There's a lot more to it, but I'm giving you the basics. Tomorrow is when uh, the master will, will explain it to you in details. I'm just giving you the basic idea right now. But when the corporation called United States uh, was founded back in the 1860s, it wanted to move overseas in, uh, at the first of the turn of the century, in the 19th century, uh, the 20th century. And so it started moving into Europe to uh, as a hostile takeover. They called it World War I. World War I was one large corporation called United States 
uh, trying to take over other major corporations in the world, like Germany, uh, France, etc. Each one of these co uh, countries are a corporation. So consequently, the United States was able to uh, be successful in the corporate takeover of uh, what the outcome of the World War I. But in the process, they lost so much money. The corporation spent so much money arming and making tanks and bullets and tanks to kill people that they, they won the hostile takeover of a foreign corporation. But now they're broke. Consequently, they are really in serious trouble now because they don't have money to feed the people at home in the corporation. And now they've taken on new corporations in Europe to be responsible for. So the United States Corporation was in very big trouble, went to Europe and asked the international bankers if they could borrow money. And the international bankers said, quite simply, no, you're bankrupt. So what have you got as collateral for, for, uh, for a loan? And they came up with the idea that your birth certificate would be worth something like $630,000 because the banker said, how much can an individual in your country working for your corporation make from the day is born to the day dies on an average? And it came out to about 630000 630,000. So consequently, the bankers made a deal with the corporation called United States to credit the United States Corporation account in Europe with $630,000 per uh, birth certificate. And this is why today uh, this uh, United States Corporation doesn't care about how many people come into this country illegally or unlawfully. They don't care about that. They open up the borders and let them pour in. Why? Because every single person coming across that border is at least a million dollars now in our bank account. And so that's why we want something called, we don't want undocumented workers. We don't care about people who are legal coming into the country. We don't want undocumented. Because with the documents, you can cash that in. You take the, uh, and get that money from the international banks. So consequently, the United States Corporation owns you. And therefore, when you go into a court, and why don't we even go to a court? You go into a court because you play basketball and tennis on a court. Why? Because the whole idea in a court is put the ball back in the other guy's court, right? I mean, the, the lawyer throws it over to him, and he throws it back to him, and the judge is sitting there as a referee. He doesn't care who wins. He's going to get paid, so he doesn't care. So the whole idea in a court is a game. And consequently, um, any time, well, there are two points you need to know about this. Uh, the judge is sitting there as a referee, and it's a game. And um, any time in this country, two points very important. Don't ever forget this. All law in this country, federal, state, county, city, any and all laws in this country, do not apply to a man or woman, natural-born man or natural-born woman. All law applies only to corporations. All law applies to corporations only. I don't care what it is. Parking tickets, speeding tickets, anything. It only applies to corporations. But however, you have been made a corporation when you were born. You were part of a corporation. So therefore, this is why all laws are any time you get a bill from Sears and Roebuck, from uh, your oil company, from a lawsuit, from a judgment in court. I don't care what the bill is. Whatever the legal and lawful paperwork that comes to you from anywhere will always have your name in all capital letters. It's always in all capital letters. Your driver's license, your insurance card, your, your, your speeding ticket, Whatever it is, it will always have your name in all capital letters. Why? Because on the international maritime law, all capital letters means you are dead. That's why when you drive by a graveyard, you will see on tombstones the name of the people who are there. Their names are in all capital letters. Why? Because that's the law. If you're dead, your name must appear in all capital letters. This is why when you walk into a courtroom, 
you do not have standing. Only the attorney or the, or the judge and the attorneys have standing. You do not have lawful standing. Meaning, uh, if you drive by a, a, a cemetery, how many people get up out of the tombs and stand and talk to you? Nobody. Why? They don't have standing in law. They don't have a leg to stand on. Okay? And neither do you. Because when you walk into a courtroom, your name on the law, uh, on the lawsuit or on the subpoena or whatever it is or on the Sears and Roebuck bill or anything else, your name is in all capital letters. It means you're a dead man. When you walk into this court, your ass is mine. You understand? You are a dead man. We bought you when you were born. And that's why a judges wear black robes, black ceremonial robes. That's why Catholic priests wear black ceremonial robes. That's why the rabbis wear black ceremonial robes. That's why when you graduate from high school and university, you wear black ceremonial robe. You know what black robes mean? You know where that comes from? It comes from the god of an ancient god in the old ancient Sumerian Babylonian system, the planet Saturn. Saturn was referred to as the god of the ring. And his priests were the god, were the priests of the black robe. This is why judges wear black robes. Catholic priests wear black robes. Darth Vader wears black robes. Vampires wear black robes. All the blood-sucking murderers wear black robes. <laughs> now, this is a black sweater. I had someone ask me that too before, why do you wear black? Because I am the incarnation of the devil. Okay. <laughs> Consequently, let's get back to Sirius. The ceremonial black robes represent a god, the planet Saturn, one of the oldest gods in the Hebrew system. Incidentally, let me backtrack a little bit on religion. The two most eclectic religions on the face of the earth. Eclectic means a conglomeration of stuff. The two most eclectic religions on the face of the earth. Number one, Judaism. Two, Christianity. Judaism and Christianity are not what they say they are. And you better do your homework. Judaism is the most confounded, eclectic, hodgepodge of stuff you're ever going to come across. All you've got to do is sit for 40 years in a theological seminary and study Judaism and Christianity, and you, if you're intellectually honest and are not afraid to speak out in public, you're going to know that Judaism and Christianity is the biggest bunch of hogwash the world has ever known. Period. <laughs> My mother had an uncle when I was growing up. My mother had an uncle who worked in the Vatican, the Secretary of State's office. I'm Italian. And my mother had an uncle who worked in the Vatican, Secretary of State's office. My mother also had two federal judges as uncles as I was growing up living in my hometown. And so I know the Catholic Church. I know the Jesuits. I understand the Mafia. I understand the Cosa Nostra. Uh, that's, that's, I mean, when I saw Godfather, I felt at home. This is, this is the way I, I, I vision life. So I know what I'm talking about. I have spent 42 years reading and studying and researching theology. That's my subject. Government is not my subject. Tomorrow I will bring the man who is the expert on this stuff, and he will really dazzle you with some things that you are not going to believe. But theology and religion is my subject. And I will tell you that I have heard many times people say, well, that there's this bad Jewish religion and there's, of course, the good Jewish religion. I say, after 40 years of this subject and looking at this, this is the most eclectic, misunderstood, most outrageous collection of stuff I have ever seen in my life. Judaism and Christianity are full with astrotheology, penis worship, all the sex worship, every kind of filthy, degenerate silliness the world has ever known. 
And this is today the basis for our legal and judicial system in America, the law of Moses. There was no Moses. I've talked to rabbis 35 years ago, rabbis, major rabbis. This particular one was the president of the American Rabbinical Association 35 years ago. And I said to him, he lives in Newton, Massachusetts, and I said, Rabbi, tell me, was there an Abraham, Isaac, a Jacob, a, a King David, King Solomon? Were these people real? And he says, come on, everybody's got a religion. I mean, the, the priests tell the, the, the Catholics they're going to heaven. You know, the Hindus tell their, their people something. The Jews got to have their religion. It's just a religion. It's a story. This is why the Bible's called the greatest story ever told. It's a story. It's nothing true. It's a story. And consequently, you're missing the whole point of the Bible if you don't understand who wrote it and what the in, encrypted story is. There's a spiritual message here, but if you're just reading the top lines, you're not getting it. People running around downstairs talking about the Antichrist. <laughs> and have no idea in the world what the word Christ means. How in the world are you going to be afraid of an Antichrist and you don't even understand what the word Christ means? Ask any Christian, what does the word Christ mean? I'm very serious about this. Look it up in the dictionary, and as a matter of fact, look it up in about 30 or 40 of them. And study it for about two weeks, the word Christ. The word Christ comes from a Greek word, Christo, which gives us Crisco cooking oil. <laughs> yeah, Pillsbury has a Crisco, which is Christo, which goes back to the word Christ. And Christ means oil. Okay? So when you say Jesus Christ, what you're saying is Jesus the Christos. I use this Christos, or Jesus the Christos, or Jesus the Christo. And when oil congeals, it becomes Lord. Look up the word Lord, L-O-R-D, and the Oxford D uh, Dictionary of the English Language, and it will tell you, L-O-R-D is correctly spelled L-A-R-D, Lord, congeal Christos. <laughs> Who the hell reads anymore? I mean, I spent... <laughs> now, when you look up the word Christos, it's oil. Then go to Bible reference work. Line them all up. There's about 60 of them out there. Line them all up and look up the word Christ. And they will all tell you it, it's a word Christos in Greek, which means anointed. No, it doesn't. It doesn't mean anointed. That's what you think it means. Christo is oil. And in the Hebrew, look up in the Hebrew dictionary, look up the word oil. It's called shemen or semen. Okay? This is why if you're going to be a priest, you've got to go to a seminary with altar boys. <laughs> you don't have any idea in the world what was going on in the Roman Empire. You quite seriously do not know what was going on in the Roman Empire. Without a doubt, the dirtiest, the filthiest, the most obscene thing on the face of the earth is Western religion. in the background and the mainstream for all wars in the Western world. I, for one, am tired of judges, and I do not intend to crawl on my knees. I prefer dying on my feet in preference to crawling on my knees to some judge. As far as I'm concerned, they're all traitors to this country. Attorneys. The word comes from a, a French word, a turn. An attorney in France was in the court of the king in France 
the guy who, when the king said, I want that guy's property, I want that guy's wife, I want that guy's children, and I want his horses. And so the man who was in charge of turning over everything to the king was referred to in the French as the Atern. He turned things over. He took from you and turned it over to the king. So he was referred to as a turn. And today we have a turn knees. That's where the word comes from. They take from the poor and give it to the rich. As far as I'm concerned, you need to understand that the entire superstructure of law in this country is based on maritime admiralty. And the maritime admiralty is saying that you are a product. They bought you when you were born. Now what you need to do is understand that there's a whole revolutionary, radical, new understanding of how this, found, how this country was founded. And if you don't understand the way this country was founded, just never going to suspect how you got into this mess. You know, when a cop pulls you over and stops you, and he gives you a ticket and he takes your, your, your license, and he will say, is this you? Well, it's got my picture on it, airhead. Can't you tell if it's me, right? And he says, is this you? Why? Because he needs for you to say that this is you. You are verbally agreeing that on your license is an all capital letters name on the Maritime Admiralty, a corporate fiction. And they must have you say that this you are agreeing to be a corporate fiction on the Maritime Law. Consequently, the entire system of government and laws is being ruled by England. Do you know why you have to have a marriage license? Why does, they, why does anybody have to have a license for anything? Uh, You've got to have a marriage license because sex is commerce. That's why you're doing commerce. Look it up. Look it up in an encyclopedia. Look up the word commerce. It'll tell you sexual relations is commerce. Don't think so? Wait till you go, wait till you go to court. Yeah, wait till the marriage doesn't work out, and when you go in, see, you're not going to go to the Lord. You're going to a judge. Why? Because it's basically commerce. It's two people providing a, a service. The man provides for the woman. The woman provides for the man. It's a business. And if you don't think so, if it don't work out, as I said, you're not going to God. You're going to court, and it's going to cost you some money. Incidentally, the uh, court, the judge rules from a bench. Uh, judge rules from the bench. The word bench in Latin is a bank. So therefore, the judge is ruling for the bank. I talked about the ancient god, and God knows I would love to talk about this for an hour, just the ancient gods of the Phoenician Canaanites and how they were picked up by the Hebrews and brought into the Roman system and from Rome into Europe and from Europe into America and today we call it Judaism and Christianity when it is in point of fact nothing more than the old Phoenician Canaanite religion worshipping the planet Saturn. This is why they still, uh, Jews still go to temple on Saturn's day. And Christians go to, because they're worshippers of the sun, they go to the church on Sunday. Do you know what the word church means? Most people uh, go to church and don't even know what the word church means. Church is an English word coming from a Scottish word, Kirk. Like Captain Kirk of the good ship Enterprise. <laughs> Kirk in Scottish is church in English. And this is, uh, Kirk goes back to a Roman goddess named Mother Circe. And Mother Circe can be traced back to a Greek goddess, Mother Circe. Mother Circe is Mother Kirk or Mother Church. Go into your mythology library and look, get some books on mythology and look up Circe. And it says Mother Circe in the ancient Roman and Greek system, especially the Greek, uh, that Mother Circe was able to hypnotize people, bring them into her home, and turn them into animals and feed off of them. And consequently, Mother Church is able to hypnotize people, bring them in, and bring your checkbook with you, and come in, and then they feed off of you. The church, the government, banking, insurance, the same people who gave you your international banking, the Knights Templars of the 10th, 11th, and 12th century who gave you international banking, also gave you international religion. 
The Pope's headdress is a, is a fish headdress. If I had brought all my slides, I could stay here all night showing you this stuff. I think perhaps the most corrupt system on the face of the earth, and it is without a doubt the enemy of every man and woman who loves freedom and honesty, is the Catholic Church, British royalty, and this mafiosi criminal syndicate we call the United States government. All three. And back in the Middle Ages, the Pope of Rome, that bastion of all goodness, the Pope of Rome, uh, incidentally, oh, I got lots of stuff when I get on the Pope. I'm Catholic. I know all about the Pope. The Pope of Rome made a proclamation in the late Middle Ages that he said that the Pope is the vicar of Christ. You may have heard that term, vicar of Christ. The word vicar in Latin simply means one who stands in for. So if you send somebody to do something for you who's the vicar, he stands in for you. So the Pope said he was the vicar of Christ, which means he's standing in for Jesus. Consequently, the idea is that God created the whole heavens and the whole earth, and he owns everything on it. And so therefore he turned it over to his son, um, Jesus, his son. But since Jesus isn't here, somebody's got to run this place. So since Jesus isn't here, the Pope said, I will be the vicar of Christ. I'll stand in for him till he gets back. Now when he gets back, I'll turn over the whole world to Christ. But until he gets here, I'm in charge, okay? As long as you understand that, we're going to do just fine. Now the first thing the Pope did after declaring himself the vicar of Christ made himself the owner of all life on the earth for Jesus. Jesus owns the whole earth, but he ain't here, so I do. Now, second... He made a contract with the king of England that was a, it was a treaty of sorts, a commercial treaty of sorts with the king of England in which he gave the possessions of Jesus, which he held as the vicar of Christ, to the king of England as a, as a holding company, a corporate holding company, so that the whole world would be under the king of England for the pope. So the Pope owns it, but the, but the president of the corporation is the King of England, and that whole corporation uh, menagerie is called the crown. And so when you hear about the British crown, you need to understand there's a world of difference between being English and British. British comes from a Hebrew word, a Hebrew word, barith. A barith is a contract. In the old Hebrew language, barith is a contract, and ish is a man or man or men. Therefore, Berith ish becomes Brit ish, man of the contract. That's why any time you do anything of any importance in this country or in the Western world, you gotta sign a contract. When you get married, you've got to have a marriage license. The same reason why attorneys have to have a license. Why does the attorney have to have a license? It's because an attorney makes a lot of money by using law books. You walk into any attorney's office, he's got all the law books. Law books, like any other book, are written by someone. Somebody wrote the books. Consequently, you cannot use somebody else's property, their written or intellectual property, to make money unless you get a signed release to allow you to use their Material, their song, their music, their pictures or something, you've got to get a signed release. And they give you the license to use their music in your movie. The same is true with an attorney. He must have a license to practice law because all law in America, in the law books, is copyrighted out of Canada, Montreal. There are five companies in Canada that copyright all American law. And they represent the British Bar Association, which is the British Accreditation Registry, BAR. And so consequently, your attorneys will tell you, I passed the bar. Don't believe it. I've seen them in bars all the time. They don't pass them. They go in. <laughs> and when you understand how the courts work, 
When you say you're an American citizen, a U.S. citizen, you're not an American. You're a United States citizen. There's a world of difference. Now, the United States federal government, I don't know if you know this or not, is a corporation, as I said, and there are many documents I have to prove that. And as I said, I'll make those available to you, but you'll have to mail my office and I'll send you the whole stack of them. The United States, the United States, it says in the law book, is located in the District of Columbia. So consequently, what we call the United States is a privately owned company sitting in a particular area called the District of Columbia. And therefore, if you are an employee of that corporation, then you have to pay taxes to that corporation. When you pay taxes in this country, the federal taxes, that does not go to the American government. The American government does not save one nickel. America makes its money the way all countries have always made their money, not off of taxing the people. They make their money by business. When ships pull in from all over the world, they have to pay duties. People have to uh, send, you know, import, export companies. Uh, America, the country, makes a lot of money, but the United States Corporation makes a lot more. Um, here it is again from a law book. It says, it is clear the United States is a sovereign entity, is a corporation. It's a privately owned company. Here's another one from a, on the corporations in law books. The United States government is a foreign corporation with respects to the states. Citizens of the United States do not enjoy citizenship rights. They are United States citizens, not American citizens. Now, there is a world of difference between being a United States citizen or an American citizen. Because before 1868, there was no such a thing as a United States citizen. There was a United States with the U and the S small letters, and then America was capital letter, first letter was capital, United States of America. America's the country. So what I, need, what I want you to understand is that there is a very simple way to figure out how you got into this mess. And do we have a full hour? Oh, good. Okay, so uh, I can get into a little bit of the religion then. Uh, let me read you something about Roman law I think is very interesting. Uh, it says, Roman law, the characteristics of the earlier Roman law was its extreme formalism. From its first secret administration as the law of privileged classes, it expanded until, until it became the basis for all civilized legal systems. The principle of Roman law, again, the characteristics of earlier Roman law was this extreme formalism. If you don't say things right in a courtroom, you fill out the papers absolutely flawlessly correct, it don't work. It's extremely formal. But it goes on to say, from its first secret administration as the law of privileged classes, it expanded until it became the basis for all civilized legal systems. So the real law, there's two laws out there, the law you think you understand, and then there's the real law, which is maritime admiralty, and that's for the privileged classes. That's on a need-to-know basis, and they don't figure you need to know. Let me go back to this uh, subject that I'm, I, I'm fascinated with, and that is the old ancient religion of the planet Saturn. Saturn First of all, and the reference works will tell you that there was a symbol that was associated with Saturn worship uh, in the ancient world. It was two triangles interlaced, triangle up and a triangle down, and it was called the Star of Saturn, Saturn Star. And today we call it the Star of David. No, the Star of David, there was no King David. The Star of Saturn. And Saturn in the old Phoenician Canaanite system was not called Saturn. It was called El, E-L. And consequently, uh, El, if you were a worshiper of El, and you were leading the worship in the church for El, the old ancient Hebrew god El, the planet, planet Saturn, you would do it on Saturn's day. So you'd go to Tent El on Saturn's day. 
and therefore you would be an elder. You are now an elder. How? How did you get to be an elder? Because you were elected. That's why you have an election. And now because you have been elected and you are an elder, you're now one of the elites. Right? You can go up a little higher now with the elevator because you've been elevated. <laughs> this is where it comes from. And how did you get to be one of the elites because you were elected by the elders? Because they had the juice, electricity, the juice, the cash flow. This is why the judge rules from the bench. The bench is a bank. Where do you find a bank? You find a bank on both sides of a river called river banks. What do river banks do? They direct the flow of the currency. This is why churches are divided by denominations, 50s, 100s, and 20s. This is very serious stuff. In this country, we have within our borders people who are so ill-informed, ignorant, and so downright stupid, they have never done any homework. They go along to get along. They don't read anything. If it wasn't for sex, drugs, and basketball, they wouldn't have anything to entertain themselves with. And the three networks. How come there's three networks? You always got to have a triune system, the triune God. Uh, I'm just amazed. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I was told by one of America's leading rabbis, there was no Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. Just a story. And I said, why? And he said, well, because the Hindus had Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. The Egyptians had Isis, Horus, uh, Osiris. Christians have got Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, so we got to have something too. So we got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I said, was there an Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? He says to me, I don't know. Was there a Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva? I don't know. Well, no, that's just a religion. So is ours, just a religion. And I get sick and tired of people who say that because you talk about uh, the Jewish religion or the Christian religion, therefore you're an anti-Semitic. Let me clarify something for you. You can call me anything you want. I'm not anti-Semitic. I'm not anti-Jewish. I'm anti-bullshit. Period. There seems to be, according to reference work, two kinds of Jews in this country. One is called a Sephardic, which are Semitic Jews. And then there is another, a larger group, three quarters of all Jews in the world are not Sephardic. They are Ashkenazi. Ashkenazi are Sephardic. Sephardic Jews are Semitic. Ashkenazis are European Germanic, German. You understand? So when, a, so when an Ashkenazi European Jew says that I am anti-Semitic, I say, first of all, are you Semitic? Well, no, I'm German. Now, what do you care if I was anti-Semitic anyway? I mean, what is it to you anyway? Because you're not even Semitic anyway. You're a German. And you better look at that word Ashkenazi. It's spelled N-A-Z-I, Ashkenazi. And you better look at the, the, the priesthood called the Nazarites. And you better start doing some homework on the word Naza, N-A-Z-A, Nazarite. Look it up in a dictionary and see how it's spelled, N-A-Z-I hyphen R-I-T-E, Nazi right. The whole entire Nazi system was a Jewish rabbinical system. And that's why the word Holocaust is used. There's a very definite reason why the word Holocaust was used. And if you're Jewish, you need to start thinking about why do you use the word Holocaust? I've sat and talked with rabbis and they tell me, okay, all right, you're right. So why don't you tell your, 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 your people? Well, hey, you go tell them, not me. Look at the word Ashkenazi. Look at the word A-S-H, the first three letters, Ash, Ashkenazi. It's 
A-S-H comes from the Ash constellation. This is why the Catholics put Ash on Holy Wednesday. They put Ash. Ash is a constellation out there in space. And the ancient Nazis, the old Nazis, said that their gods who came from another world, that they were the, 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 the progenitors of a great mass a race of people, came from the Ash constellation. And I said to myself, and I asked the rabbi, does that have anything to do with the Ashkenazi, N-A-Z-I? And if that does, then is there something there about this whole thing, Holocaust? Asking a Jew what a Holocaust is is like asking a Christian what Christ means. They haven't got the faintest idea. It was a terrible, bad thing. What, what happened? I know it was a terrible thing, and they killed a lot of Jews. Well, they killed a lot of other people, too. Why do you use the word Holocaust? Very interesting, I suspect. A holocaust is, first time we come across the word holocaust is in the Bible in Genesis. And it says that Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel, and they both, uh, both of the sons offered up sacrifices to God. And they were burnt offerings. So they were, and it's referred to in the Bible as a holocaust. Cain offered up his holocaust to God, and Abel offered up his holocaust to God. All right. A holocaust is a sacrificial, ritualistic, burnt offering. A sacrificial, ritualistic, burnt offering to God. Consequently, when you use the word holocaust, the holocaust is a sacrificial, ritualistic, burnt offering, meaning that somebody was killing Semitic Jews and offering them up as a deal. They're offering them up on the altar as a sacrifice for a deal. What was the deal? Who were the parties to the deal? And what was the name of the tune here? And then I start talking to rabbis and they'll say, well, you know, uh, that's a very uh, touchy subject. Yeah, well, I'm going to touch it. Because as far as I'm concerned, I am sick and tired of hearing people who have honest questions being called anti-Semitic by Jews who are not even Semitic. They're Germans. Where the hell does anybody get off of calling their fellow citizens in any country a name because they ask a question? You say something about the Pope and all you got to do is read history and you'll see it. Therefore, you're now Catholic bashing. No, I'm intellectually honest and I'm tired of bullshit. Period. Second, I'm tired of being told how holy Israel is because I will guarantee you there's nothing holy in Israel. The only thing holy coming out of Israel are the stories. They're full of holes. <laughs> anybody that does their homework, anybody that does their homework knows. There's a whole world of lies and deception going on in the Middle East from drug worship, penis worship, sex worship, sun worship, human sacrifice. Oh, well, we would never do a human sacrifice. I mean, that's terrible. Was Jesus human? Oh, yes, he was human. Was he sacrificed? Yes. So then he was a human sacrifice? It's incredible. You realize that Christianity is nothing more than the oldest and most ancient pagan religion the world has ever known. It's called sun worship. This is my feel now. Now I feel more comfortable in this. If you go back to day one and go back as far back into ancient history as you can go, you will find and discover that the most uh, ancient concept of evil in the world was darkness. The whole human family realized that when the sun went down, it got dark. And consequently, in the Egyptian system, the, the sun which comes up in the morning was our risen Savior. And of course, the sun is your risen Savior. You don't think so? Wait till it don't come up. <laughs> right? It's your risen Savior. Yes, the sun is your Savior. And consequently, the ancient Egyptians said that the sun walked across the sky in 12 equal steps, and his name was Horus. 
there were 12 Horuses. And Horus walked across the sky in 12 equal steps. This is where we get the alcoholic 12-step program. <laughs> yeah, you go through school. You've got to go through the 12-step program to the 12th grade. Why? Because of Jesus with the 12 apostles, the 12 brothers of Joseph, the 12 tribes of Israel. There was no tribes of Israel. That's why they say, well, we can't find them. The reason you can't find them is the same reason why Jesus is not coming back. He wasn't here to start with. It's a story, for God's sakes. And the rabbis and the priests know that. I used to sit around and listen to the priests shoot the breeze all the time, lighten up, talking about... Yeah, this is, a, this is a sensational thing we got going here. Hey, the same people who gave you the mafia gave you the church. The church is the mafia. I had, a, I had an FBI man call me many years ago, I feel safe now saying this, from, from San Diego, and I was in Los Angeles, and I got a phone call from an FBI man. And he said, this is not business, it's a social call. So I said, give me a name and where are you out of? And he said, San Diego. And I got his name. And I said, I'll call you back. I hung up and I called information and asked for the FBI in San Diego. Then I called that number and asked for him and they put me through. Now at least I know he is who he says he is. So then I said to him, all right, talk to me. What do you want? And he said, I just want to tell you that we've been watching you. We follow you wherever you go. We know what you're doing, okay? And he says, but... We, you are not a threat, and the people here at the FBI, the working class guys here at the FBI, we admire what you're doing, what you're trying to do. And he said, but your government does not consider you to be a threat yet. But if you get enough people listening to you, and they're not just listening, but they're actually hearing you, then you will be considered a threat, and now we'll have to take another look at what you're going to do, Okay. And he said, but the reason I'm calling you is to tell you and warn you. And this is an unofficial call. When you talk about corruption and government, most people in government couldn't care less. They don't care. They know. They, they're, they're corrupt and they know it and you know it. So what are you going to do about it? But when you talk about the church and religious institutions in this country, he said to me, what you're doing is you are messing with organized crime at its highest levels. The highest levels of organized crime in this country are the religious institutions. We're talking about a lot of money. We're talking about the control of men's minds. We're talking about the, the dream of absolute total domination. This makes the mafia look like child's play. And consequently, I have an FBI man telling me, when you talk about the church, you're talking about the mob. And I know that's true. How come the Pope and the, and the, and the, and the Cardinals wear the little Jewish yarmulke? Anybody ever thought about that? Remember the Pope wears the little, little beanie cap? I thought that's Jewish. How many Jews in this world do not know that the beanie that they wear, the little yarmulke, is not Jewish? That's not Jewish. It's Roman. That's why the Pope wears it. And the Jews in the Middle Ages were told to show respect for That's why women were always to wear a headdress, because they had to show respect for their father, their, their, their husband. Consequently, the man had to wear the headdress to show his respect for the Pope and for the church. So when a Jew wears the yarmulke, he's showing respect for his masters, the Roman masters. And today, how many people know that? And I mean, how many people even give a damn? Nobody reads. And consequently, as I said in the beginning, we're all word control humans. And I don't like being called names. I am, an, I am fascinated. I, I don't even like being introduced as an authority because in point of fact, I'm not an authority on anything. After 42 years, I am totally convinced I'm not. I'm not, a, I'm not an authority on anything. I'm just an ordinary man pursuing extraordinary knowledge. If you've got, you got more than 500 brain cells, you can read a book. You can go to a library and start reading about religion, start reading about organizations, 
Start reading about organized crime, and before you know it, you start finding out the United States government is a, is a fraud. It's a privately owned corporation. It's a fraud. And then you begin to see how the whole world system we live under is a fraud. It's a racist fraud. It keeps people at, at odds. Well, of course, it makes sense why there's wars. I mean, think about Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler was a classic example. It's one of my favorite examples. Uh, in 1913, when the 14, 1915, whatever, when the war was finally over, I think it was 1919, it was finally over, uh, Germany had not only surrendered, but it was totally starving. It was broke. There were people dying in the streets of starvation. There, as a matter of fact, I, you see pictures in the old newsreels of every, uh, half, uh, every six or twelve hours, uh, horse-drawn carriages would go through the major cities of Germany and pick up the people who had actually starved to death on the street. That's how bad off Germany was. Then comes a few years later, uh, a man named Adolf Schickelgruber became known as Adolf Hitler, and he starts ranting and raving about all the terrible things that happened to the wonderful uh, German people. And um, before you know it, he starts getting financial backing, and in about seven years, built the greatest military war machine the world has ever known. Have you ever tried to buy a battleship or a tank? Have you ever tried to buy machine guns? And Adolf Hitler financed the greatest single war machine, and the Nazis were the best dressed, the best fed, the most well-armed, the most well-trained, they were a frightening display of despotic power on the face of the earth. And no one seems to have asked the question, where the hell did they get the money? They were broke. Where did they get the money? Well, they got the money from, first, British royalty. English royalty are the biggest Nazis on the face of the earth. The queen mother that rides around in her golden chariot, a Nazi. A murderous, blood-sucking Nazi. And all of her holy family, Prince Charles, when I was in England, and I spoke in northern England, Friday night I was speaking uh, uh, to this English audience on uh, Saturday. And that night before I was sitting in the hotel watching the birthday of Prince Charles. And Prince Charles is uh, the Queen Mum. I think that's what they call her, Queen Mum. And she comes out and she's uh, uh, Queen Mum and says uh, it's her son's birthday, Prince Charles, and everyone politely applauds. They better. They better applaud because they, the queen owns them. And consequently, he comes out and she introduces him and she calls him, uh, he comes out and calls her, thank you, mummy. And everyone thought that was clever. Prince Charles, at his age, calling his mother mummy. So I said to the English audience, I said, as an American, i got to tell you, this woman looks like a mummy. <laughs> you put a $100,000 dress on this chump, and she still looks like a mummy. <laughs> I think the, the dirtiest, the filthiest, the most licentious, and the filthiest people on the face of the earth are the British royalty. They represent in the human race all that is evil, and all that is filthy and degenerate. And when you stop and think about, say it again. Yes, and that's why she's dead. Diana. John Kennedy probably had a little flash of decency and they got rid of him. You think it was an accident that Ted Kennedy got into his accident the mob is good at fixing up accidents I think that John Kennedy Bobby Kennedy and Ted Kennedy's accident I think somebody was wiping out the whole Kennedy Kennedy dynasty the Kennedys were involved in a lot of things Joe Kennedy the father of John Kennedy was a criminal of the highest repute he was a gun runner prostitution Every kind of filthy degeneracy, John F. Kennedy's father was the biggest criminal, one of the biggest criminals this country has ever, ever had. Okay? And consequently, B. 
being one of the biggest criminals, he was sent to England by Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt sent Joe, uh, Joe Kennedy to England um, to be ambassador to St. James's Court during the war. And a lot of the people here in this country ask, uh, how come you're sending Joe, uh, Joe Kennedy, who everybody knows is a gangster? And, and Roosevelt said, the whole world is run by criminals. I want the best we got over their representatives. <laughs> And Joe Kennedy, one of his first official pronouncements as the ambassador to, ambassador to England, one of his first official pronouncements, and he was fired and brought back to this country in disgrace. He went out before the English people and said, we're fighting the wrong guy. We should support Hitler. This is what your, this is what your, your, your leaders are. They're Nazis. All the guys back home, we're all Nazis. You should be helping Hitler. So I'm saying to myself, and he, this is what he said, that the, that the people of England should be supporting Adolf Hitler, and he was fired because of that and brought back home. I'm saying that there's a lot of words and terms that we uh, use today that we don't understand where they come from. We haven't got the faintest idea in the world what these, what these words mean. When you walk by a church, you go by a church, and you see the pointed arch windows, why do churches have pointed arch windows? Many of the church doors have pointed arch doors. I mean, logic would tell you it's the female. The box, the female box is the female. That's why the priest is only the man can be a priest in a Christian church up until recently because the man, uh, it, it, it's symbolic. The man is in charge inside the female arch, not the female. So consequently, it's, it has to do with sexual symbolism. Uh, it's an extraordinary story of betrayal. But let me agree, let me explain to you something very important and listen closely. There's nothing holy in Israel. There's nothing holy in Salt Lake City. There is for sure nothing holy in Rome. There's nothing holy anywhere on the earth. The, if there's anything that, when speci especially the word very, the very word holy, you better check that one out. But the concept of something being sanctimonious or beautiful or holy, that may be with God who is in heaven, but it is not here with us. We do not have anything on the earth which is holy. The only holiness that you could hope to uh, achieve is between you and your Creator. And it doesn't need a man, a, a, a priest, a rabbi, a clergyman of any kind who are all licensed by the state, 501c3 licensed corporations, to speak for you. You realize when you... When you get... When, when, you, when you buy a new car, you get something in the glove compartment called an operator's manual. And so the word operator means that you're buying the vehicle for your personal use. And consequently, if you're buying the vehicle for your personal use, by law, you are referred to as an operator of a vehicle. However, if you're going to use the wheels, truck, motorcycle, bicycle, whatever it is, if you're going to use the wheels to make money, now you're in business. Now, now that you're in business, we're talking money now, so therefore you've got to have a business license to conduct business with the wheels. And according to the law, if you're conducting business, you are now, now no longer referred to as an operator of a vehicle. You are now called a driver, a truck driver, a cab driver, a bus driver. Driver means you're in business to make money. Operator means you own it yourself. So why the hell do you need a driver's license if you're not making money with the wheels? You don't. It's just that nobody ever told you that. So when you walk in and say, I want a driver's license, they figure, well, okay, then you must be using it to make money. They don't know. How many people know these little small things? And when you walk, when you go to... Uh, if a cop pulls you over to arrest you, and he reads out the he reads out what he's arresting you for, and he says, "Do you understand the charge?" You know, you see it on these cop shows at night, 
and they and they will read out the charge of the poor guy and they say all right here's what you've done wrong and then do you understand the charge why do they say that it's because if you say to the police no I do not understand the charge they cannot arrest you the law said you cannot be arrested if you do not understand the charge so all you got to do is play dumb I don't understand the charge and they'll say well the law says there's a red light and if you go through it you broke the law we saw you go through the red light and you broke the law and that's why we are arresting you or giving you the ticket now do you understand the charge you say nope what is it you don't understand I don't understand the charge what is it about huh no I haven't needed to because I drive safe and sanely But I don't have to uh, have five children to know what getting married is like, you know. I don't have to do everything so that I can speak from experience. I can speak from experience on much of what I'm telling you. And the other, I can just read like any dope could read a law book. Consequently, I'm saying that we are in the hands, this country is in the hands of traitors, people who are manipulating and using us and it's and it's being done in such a way that you would never ever suspect how uh, devious this whole system is now back to I only got a few minutes more according to my uh, calculation I only got about 10 15 minutes right huh? okay um, Tomorrow, I'm going to have a friend of mine, a partner a friend of mine named Victor. Vic is a publisher of the book called Cracking the Code. Uh, it's a book about the, ex you know, if you read it, uh, seen it, Cracking the Code? Well, uh, and that's my company that, that published it. And um, so I'm going to have him explain a little bit about the Uniform Commercial Code and how it affects you. But I also, am, you are going to hear something that is really, truly startling. Did you know, for instance, that when you get uh, a ticket of any kind, a speeding ticket, that they always, the officer will give you the ticket and say, and he'll sign it, and that you've got 45 days to take care of this, a month and a half? Why? Why did they give you a month and a half? It's because the police know and the system knows Oh, and that just reminded me. You know where the word system comes from? You've got a judicial system, an educational system, uh, you know, a, a, a banking system. The word system is a Latin word. It, it was a word for the sewer. In Rome, they call it the sewer system. That's what we got here, the sewer system. Uh, anyway, when, when you get the... Uh, what was I talking about? <laughs> 45 days. The reason why they give you 45 days is because if you go in, it says that you are not agreeing that you are guilty of anything when you sign a ticket. You are usually a month and a half later. Because the law book says if you come in within the first 10 days, there is no charge. No one's ever said you were guilty of anything. There is no charge. You walk in well, within the first 10 days and you have a form. There's a couple of forms you fill out and then they will tell you, well, we can't handle this right now because we don't have your paperwork yet. And you say, of course you don't have my paperwork yet. You want it to go after the 10 days because after the 10 days you are now guilty by default. You now are guilty by default because you did not take care of the ticket within the first 10 days. Because if you walk in within the first 10 days, and it's best to bring a, 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 a witness with you, with the form, and you walk in and say, I want to take care of this, I, here I am, it says on a before, so here I am before, I want to take care of this. Now I want you to take this off of my record, get rid of this thing because there's no charges on there. I came in on or before. And they'll say, well, we don't have the paperwork on it yet. You say, well, it's too bad. Here's what the law says. The law says on or before, and I'm in here before. 
Here is the form. I filled it out saying that I was here. I have a witness that I'm here. I'm giving it to you. And when you walk off, they have to tear the ticket up and throw it away because there was no charge and you came in within the first 10 days and there's no charge and they throw it away. But everybody thinks, oh, well, I've got a month and a half, leave it. Good. All you need to do is leave it 11 days, and they've got you now. You lost by default. Say it again. Of course I do. What am I doing? I'm sitting here in front of 100 people uh, talking to myself? Of course. I'm in an office that gets over 100 phone calls a day. From all over North America, the Bahamas, all over creation. I personally get 15 to 20 phone calls from all over the world every day. But especially does the company get at least 100 phone calls a day from all over North America, Canada. And people are sending us wires. They're sending us uh, emails, faxes. People are coming by the office four or five times a day. People are coming from all over the country, coming out to visit. They come by the office. They show us what they did. They sit down and tell us how they did it. Here's what we did. We followed your book. We followed this material you gave us here. And here's what they did. Here's, uh, here's how we saved the house. We saved this. We saved that. Do you realize when you walk into a bank, when you walk into a bank and you want to borrow money on a new home or a car, you know what happens? This is very interesting. When you walk into a bank and you ask for a loan, to buy a house or a new car, what they will do is they first of all check your credit to make sure you can pay for it. Second, if they decide that they will finance the, the new car for you, they have to have the, the, the agency, the new car agency, has to have a form showing exactly what that automobile costs, what it is appraised at with a state appraisal on that vehicle. This car is worth this much stamped by the state. This is how much the vehicle's worth. And consequently, they can take that now, because this car is worth, say, $35,000, that's the worth of the car. The state then allows the bank to take this uh, ownership of the car, the paperwork, and put it into a private bank account in your name. They open up a checking account in your name, and they don't tell you that. So they come out with the papers, these chumps, they come out and say, oh, here's all the paperwork. We've got it all done. I say, yeah, I'll bet you've got it all done. You lousy. I'll bet you've got it all done. Let me read the papers that you've got all done, chump. Then you say, well, here's all the papers. Yeah. Then you find out what they've done is they took the ownership of the vehicle, the amount that the state agrees to that the vehicle is worth and puts it into a checking account and opens up a checking account and signs your name to it unlawfully. They sign your, your full name to it. And now you have a second checking account. If you have one at the bank, now you got two. Now the checking account has $35,000 in it. So then they write a check on your checking account for 35000 and give it to the auto agency to pay for the car. And now they keep the ownership of the, of the car until you pay them the 35000 with interest. But the point is they never loaned you a nickel. They took the vehicle, which was worth 35000 opened up a checking account in your name, unlawfully, illegally, it's a felony to sign another person's name on a checking account. And the banks do it all the time. And now there's 35000 in there. They type out a check on the new checking account, and you get it, thinking the bank is giving you money. No, Arrowhead, they're giving you a piece of paper that is based on the value of the car. So consequently, the bank is giving you zero nothing. But you're going to give them interest. Now, once you understand that according to the law, that is a felony. The bank, can, uh, the bank can be shut down. The president of the bank can go to jail. It's a felony. People have signed names illegally and passed paper 
on the maritime law, money has changed hands, and it was a total illegal act on the international law. And consequently, the bankers know that, and everybody knows it, but it works. So all you've got to do is get the right form, and we have it, the right form, you fill it out, and you send it to the Department of State, the State Department of the United States, and the Department of the Treasury, and to the bank, and you serve notice on them. They're all going to jail. They're all going to jail for felonies, right? And the first thing they do is they will call you and contact you and, well, let's talk this over. Let's see what we can do. And we've had people come in our office and say to us and show us, they just give us a card. They just, just give it to us and told us, just go on out of here and get out of here. And don't, don't. They said, what? Well, it's either that or their ass is going to jail, one of the two. Do you know how many people, how, how disruptive this could be if all people who are buying new cars and homes and whatever went in and said to the bank, I want to know, under law, I want you to testify before me, and I have two witnesses, did you give me money from the bank to buy this car? No. Then why am I paying you money back if you didn't give me any money to start with? I said, well, that's the way it works. No, no, it, that's the way it works with everybody else. That ain't the way it works with me. And so consequently, once you understand the way the system works, you're going to see that religion, politics, government, the entire social structure in the Western world is a very corrupt system. Okay? But I believe that the original country called America the concept, as, as filled with imperfections as it was and still is, I believe that America offers the greatest single potential for freedom the world has ever known. I think it is the greatest single country ever founded by men. But I think now we have something called consensus reality. Ask, ask anyone in, in the science, the mind sciences, what it means. Consensus reality means that we have laws and regulations over us. They're not laws. Where is the law that says I have to do this or that? Where is the law that says I have to do that? And Well, of course, the code says, I didn't ask you what the code was. I asked you where is the law? And then you find out that 95% of everything we call laws in America are not in point of fact laws at all. They are not there at all. Go back in the law book and find it. Find the law that says I have to do this. It's not there. So it's called consensus reality. We have come to accept things because everybody else accepts it. Well, I don't accept any of it. I don't accept the religious foundation, the political, none of the rest of it. And I think that you're going to be totally amazed tomorrow when you hear Vic explain one of the most revolutionary, radical things that you could do in this country. And I'm not going to tell you what it is, but if you understand the concept tomorrow, Vic is going to explain it. It's going to be the most outstanding thing you're ever going to hear about how you can be totally free overnight by just filling out a couple of forms and repatriating, you repatriate out of a country, you, what's the, what's the word, um, when you come out of a country, and expatriate, you can, you can expatriate out of the United States corporate system and repatriate back into the country as an American citizen. And if you do that, it's just paperwork. It's not commercial. It's, it's political. You expatriate out of the United States and repudiate the United States citizenship. You, re, you come out of the corporate system and then repatriate into the American system, and you get the paperwork right from Washington, D.C., saying you are now an American citizen. You are no longer considered by law a United States citizen. And as such, you are considered by law absolute total sovereigns. This is why in the Wild West days, what? 
Don't need one if you're an American. Say it away. Hold on. There's a whole, there's a whole, yeah, tomorrow I'm going to let him do it. Look at, do you remember in the Wild West days, the, uh, the John Wayne movies, the old cowboy movies, when the guys are right into town and they're carrying their guns on their hips and they go into the bar and they have a few drinks and then they have a few words with another guy at the other end of the bar? And they say, hey, if you can't, if you can't handle it, let's go outside. So the two guys go outside and they, and they, and they, and they stand against each other in the street with the women and children and everybody standing there and they draw on each other. And whoever happens to be faster uh, kills the other guy, right? And did they were they put in jail? No. Why? And when the and when, in those in those old cowboy movies, when the sheriff would come out to the guy's ranch, remember in the movies the old guy would come out on the porch with the shotgun and he'd cock the shotgun and said, "That's far enough, sheriff. Don't come any further. What do you want here on my property?" And the sheriff would always say, "No, no. We're just coming out here to talk to you. Remember?" How come? How come you could walk out with a shotgun and cock it and say, hey, you stop there. Don't you come on my property. All right? And you can walk into a bar with your gun on your hip. And if a guy gives you any mouth, you go out in the street and take care of it right then and there. Why? It's because you were a sovereign. You were a United, not a United States citizen, but you were an American citizen. And as an American citizen, the law says you are an absolute sovereign. That's why as if you were the king of England, you, as the king of England has the right to have his own arms. He can, he can call up an army anytime he wishes. He can have arms because he's a king. But so can the king of France and the king of Germany. And if the king of Germany gets up one day and just decides he doesn't like the looks of this king of France anymore, he can declare war on him. Now, it might not be that easy. It might go the other way, and the king of France, uh, you know, will destroy Germany. But the two kings have the right to declare war on each other to the death. That's what, that's what you can do if you're a king. And that's the way it was when this country was founded. Every individual was considered on the international maritime law to be a sovereign. You can carry a gun. You protect your home with a shotgun or a, or a rifle. And you were a free man. It was only until 1868 that they done slipped this corporation in on us and got our birth certificates because you came down your birth canal. And consequently, you are a maritime admiralty product because you came out of your mother's water. You need to wake up and find out it's very, very simple. They just didn't tell you. It's like anything else. It's up here. Knowledge is power. All you've got to do is just fill out the paperwork and say that you are getting out of the federal corporation and want to be an American citizen. It takes about two weeks. The paperwork comes back to you. You are now an American citizen. And from that point on, it will tell you all the things that you are now allowed to do. You can carry a gun any place you wish. You can go anywhere you please. You pay no this. You don't pay that. You cannot be brought to court. You cannot be subpoenaed to a court. No courts in this country apply to you because there are no courts for American citizens. They're all courts are for United States citizens. Consequently, this is a whole new concept. And actually, it's based on the way the country was founded. This is why I want you to be here tomorrow to listen to Vic, because he's far more interesting on this subject than I am. He's a brilliant man on this subject, and then you can ask those questions. But how would you like to be? How would you like to be able? Because I know when I was a kid, I used to ask my parents, why is it I as a child have to listen to what everybody tells me? I mean, as even a little kid, I would ask that. As a matter of fact, when I was confirmed in the Catholic Church, I was confirmed about eight or nine years old, ten years old, and uh, we were told that after the confirmation, the bishop might ask the children if they wanted to ask the bishop a question. And if you ask the question, the nun said, we'll break your face, okay? <laughs> so uh, just sit quiet, okay? So when the confirmation ceremony was over and of course my fam my family having vatican officials in the family and all that it was a very big thing i was being i was being confirmed it was a big to do that night at the church and a lot of people were there and after the confirmation ceremony was over 
uh, the bishop said, uh, now that, uh, you know, now that your children are Catholic, do you have any questions for your, for your bishop? And I stood up and said, yeah, I have a question. I got one. And I said, um, can I, my father works with torches, like a welder. Can I take a torch and turn it up and burn an angel? If an angel was here, could I burn him? Would it hurt him? And he said, why, why? I said, I want to know. Can I take a torch and burn an angel? Would it hurt him? He says, no. Why not? He said, well, an angel is a spirit. You can't burn a spirit because you've got to have wood or paper or something to burn. Fire is a natural phenomenon. You can't burn a spirit. And I said, well, then why am I worried about going to hell when my spirit will burn for hell forever if you can't burn a spirit? <laughs> and the mere fact that, that I got the kind of reception afterwards I, I got, my mother said, don't you ever do that again. And my dad, yeah. My dad said, great. <laughs> so I grew up understanding that there is two systems in the world today. There are two kinds of people in the world today, basically. The kind that get it and the kind that don't get it. If you got it, you understand that the whole world... Look at Do you remember the movie Godfather? What about Godfather 3? Did that tell you something? In the movie Godfather 3, at the end of the movie, Michael Corleone, as the old man, sits out on the veranda with his, with his sister, if you'll recall, toward the end of the movie. Major stuff, he says. He said, you know, sister, when I was growing up, I used to think the higher up you go in society, the more correct and lawful and legal everything had to be. And now I look back on life and I know it's just the opposite. Hey, the higher you go, the bigger the criminals are. I understood this as a young kid. My father used to tell me, you can sit and listen, you sit over in the corner and you shut up. If I want something out of you, I'm going to knock it out of you, okay? So sit there and shut them out and just listen. Because I want you to learn that there are two kinds of worlds that we live in. The world that we all relate to every day and the real world of where the power is. And the real world is an occult world. The word occult simply means hidden. And the real truth about who's running this planet, who owns us, how they're manipulating, financing governments, religions, wars, all of this stuff, has been for too many years an occult subject on a need-to-know basis, and they figure you don't need to know. I'm telling you, if you're going to save yourself and this country, and I believe, and let me say this very clearly, I believe that America is the greatest country that's ever been created. I love the country, and I love the concept of freedom. I would much prefer standing on my feet and dying on my feet than crawling on my knees to somebody who thinks they own me, because nobody owns me. And consequently, you need to stand up and start making your own decisions and don't buy the crap that's coming across in media and understand that there's some very powerful people in this world behind the scenes that are manipulating through stealth and guile, through money, through manipulation, blackmail. They are manipulating our country. And I want to expose these people. They're traitors to my country. And I want to expose them. Catholic priests do not salute a flag in this country. Catholic priests owe no allegiance to this country whatsoever. Who are these people? Who are these people who have formulated religions and churches and call themselves royalty and have a divine right of kings? I don't buy it. Not for a minute. I'm an American. And I love America because it's a free country and I want to keep it that way. And Thomas Jefferson said, anyone who expects to be free and ignorant expects something that's never been and never will be. If you're going to be free, you better wake up and stop doing your homework because the people that are running this country are nothing but lousy criminals. And all of it can be traced back to England, to the British royalty, and to that international intrigue going on throughout the world. Ask the people... Of the, of the darker world, of the eastern world, about the British. Ask them about the English. 
As again, I said, and I want to make it clear, I love England. I love the English people. I don't have a dime for British royalty or any of the traitors in this country who have thrown in with our masters. I am all for freedom, and I'd like to be able to help you to understand that this is now a time for people to wake up. Do not be waiting for the Messiah to come back. There is no Messiah coming back. Why? Because he was never here to start with. Do not look for the God of the Bible to save you. That where was the God of the Bible when Jews were being marched into concentration camps? That God is not going to help you. No God is, no man-made God is going to help any of us. We're going to stand on our feet as Americans, start doing your homework, and start standing up for what is right. And I want to thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank you. Thank you.